Hi, everybody. Today, we'll talk about the second chapter of Bishop Barron's book from 2002 called The Strangest Way. And I've given this lecture the title, The Sense of Sin, or Robert Barron on The Sense of Sin. Sin is going to be the focus of these remarks. It's the focus of Barron's second chapter, and it is for him one of the paths that Christians walk. And this is a path associated with Christian spirituality. Now, it's an interesting theme because sin is not something that a lot of people are comfortable talking about these days, at least not in the northeastern part of the United States where, where I'm recording these lectures, and in ways for good reason. Uh, there's a certain sense of a, a burden of guilt imposed by sin or a belief that a person might feel uh, disempowered, might feel less able to, say, overcome things in her life if she is, as we say, burdened with a sense of sin. Uh, what Barron is arguing here, though, and I think it's very interesting and, and in my opinion, important, uh, is that this sense of sin is core to the Christian message, um, not feeling guilty about doing this or that, although that might be included, but something deeper than that, something that affects who we are most fundamentally. So let's hop into it here and take a look at um, some of what Barron says in connection with this. There's our title, The Strangest Way, Robert Barron. Robert Barron does not mention Pope Pius XII in his, uh, in his chapter, um, but I do here, and I would actually lead off with this quotation. Uh, Pius XII was, was Pope just before John XXIII, so during the 1940s and, and 50s. Uh, in 1946, in a radio message to the National Catechetical Congress, so catechesis is basically religious education, so people teaching people about um, the Catholic faith, uh, Pius XII said the following, Perhaps the greatest sin in the world today is that men have begun to lose the sense of sin. Men have begun to lose the sense of sin. Okay, well, what does that mean? I would propose to you the following. Christianity is a salvation religion. If you think that there's something wrong with your life, that somehow something needs to change, something is off, out of whack, then you might need salvation. You might need to be saved. You might need to fundamentally change your life in some way. If you think that pretty much everything is fine and you're a good person and you're doing your best and everyone's going to come out good in the end anyway, then it's unclear perhaps why Christianity would be needed. Why is the Christian message needed? We're going to see some different definitions of sin in these remarks um, through Barron's text. I'm reminded as we begin, though, of a way that Houston Smith, a famous historian of religion, talked about uh, the notion of suffering in the Buddhist context, the context that might be familiar to many of us watching. What did he say? The, the, the term used in Pali uh, for suffering in that context means a lack of fit, something like like if you take your car to the... To the um, shop and you need to get your wheels aligned, right? If the wheels are out of alignment, you, you're, you're lacking a, a good fit, you know, between the tire and, and the, the axle or the body of the car. And over time, that is going to destroy that car. It's going to throw everything off, right? And if you're aware of that and you can take care of that alignment issue, okay, well, we're playing baseball. That's the way. Um, if you can't, then we have a problem. I don't know what happened with the video there, so we're just going to kind of go with it and assume that the audio is doing okay. Um, hopefully, it'll correct itself. Okay, so in chapter two, in my reading of it, Barron takes on this sense of sin, right? He takes on the idea that we need to be somehow awakened to sin um, and tries to explain what this means in the context of the Christian, uh, call it spiritual tradition. So we begin by talking about uh, under this heading, uh, the awakening to sin. Uh, that's a title that I've given the opening pages of the chapter. We go on to talk about the nature of sin. Uh, also, um, the text associated with this chapter in Barron's uh, discussion is Dante's Purgatorio. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit about the Divine Comedy, although there's an entire lecture on the Divine Comedy elsewhere on this channel, and I would refer interested viewers to that. 
he goes on to talk about Jesus as judge and savior. So this is the, the function of Jesus specifically uh, in this system. Um, and continues um, by identifying some specific practices that he uh, believes can be followed uh, by a person wishing to walk this second path of the Christian spiritual tradition. So let's move on um, and discuss these things. I would hazard, as, as we kind of begin again here, so we've, we've referred to Pius XII and this notion of the sense of sin, I'd also raise this um, example of St. Augustine, whom is uh, referred to uh, here uh, a few times in the chapter, and someone who's certainly not referred to, and, and that's the philosopher uh, Georg Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel. Uh, the philosopher Hegel from the early uh, 19th century was active in the first decades of the 19th century in Germany. Um, when I was in graduate school, I wrote a paper um, for a seminar that, that focused uh, together on the works of Augustine and Hegel. And I remember I titled it something like The Sick and the imperfect. The sick and the imperfect. So Augustine, and this is the message of the traditional Christian tradition, Augustine is arguing that there is something wrong with us. We are sick. We are not in the sense of perverse, although, I mean, that might be included too, but we are ill. We are somehow unwell. We are in need of medical attention as it were, right? We are injured. So what is required on Augustine's view, uh, and the view I, I would hazard again of the Orthodox Christian tradition over time, is help. We need someone to help us. We need someone to save us, right? Um, Hegel, on the other hand, I argued in that paper, and I would present it here just as a way of kind of, by contrast, getting at, at the thing we're talking about, which is sin. From Hegel's point of view, a, a, a sin, something we do that, that is wrong or is regarded as wrong, can be understood as a stage on the way to a fuller perfection, that things through a process that he in some way refers to as the dialectic, this is a well-known feature of Hegel's view, things are going to work themselves out. Even really bad things, even things that are really painful or, or difficult at the moment, in the end, they're going to come out right. Um, and that's a great uh, confidence that his system has. We're, we're, let, let, um, we're uh, on our way toward, we're, our path is leading toward what he calls absolute knowledge. Very different from Augustine's view. And it, this is one of those questions, friends. It's, it's always seemed to me, and I, I don't know if, if you've thought about it in this way, but it's one of those questions where you kind of got to decide where you stand on it. It makes a difference. Are we, quote unquote, to use the word again, sick, right? I mean, do we actually need help? Do we need a savior? Or are we just kind of not perfect yet? You know, we're, we're, we're gonna, it's going to be fine in the end. Everything is going to work out. We just got to kind of stay the course. Um, fundamental question, very hard to answer. Each of us has to answer it very much for, for herself, himself. Another image, um, and I know we haven't even gotten to the slides proper yet, but this is a, um, a painting by Caravaggio, the painter, 1601. Um, Baron refers to this. This is the conversion of St. Paul, or I should say a detail from that, that painting. I figured on the small screen we should probably go with the detail. This is Paul himself. Paul, of course, um, St. Paul the Apostle, was formerly known as Saul. Uh, and Saul, in a way, was doing fine. He, he, he was uh, learned in the law. He was respected. He had authority given him from the, the, the temple uh, authorities to seek out followers of this Christian way. He was strong. He was sharp. He was clever. He was feared, right? But here's Paul, or that is, I should say, Saul, you know, in the moment of becoming Paul, he takes on that new name. Um, he does an about face. In, in, in this case, he's literally blinded for three days, uh, and, and then the scales, as we say, the scales fall from his eyes, and he's able to see uh, the truth of the way, the truth of, that is, the Christian message that he had been persecuting. Um, this kind of about face, this conversion experience, I mean, Augustine goes through something like this as well in the garden, this is characteristic of at least traditional Christianity. Something like this is still plainly visible in AA meetings, for example, right? I mean, hi, I'm John and I'm an alcoholic, right? Not 
I'm a pretty okay guy who once in a while has problems drinking, but I am an alcoholic, right? I am, in this context, a sinner, right? I, 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 I am ill with a condition that, that leads me to perpetually fall short of what I would actually wish to do in ways that harm myself and others. I need help, right? I need help in the context of AA from all of you, right? Or in the Christian context specifically, I need help from Christ. I need help from God through Jesus Christ. I need a savior. Okay, so Awakening to Sin, the title that, that I have foisted upon the first pages of Barron's chapter here. Well, one thing that he starts with, I mean, G.K. Chesterton can always be relied upon for a, a, a pithy kickoff to any discussion. Chesterton um, uh, writes, a saint only means a man who really knows that he is a sinner. And Barron goes on about this in several ways, using various examples of well-known Christian saints. A saint only means a man who really knows that he is a sinner. If I think, yeah, I'm pretty okay, I'm probably not pretty okay. That's the message of this tradition. Realizing one's, and let's, let's use the word, all, all of these words uh, tend to, to put the hairs up on the back of our neck, right? Knowing one's depravity, depravity. What, what does depravity mean? To be depraved, to be deprived of something, right? Is to lack something, not to have something that we otherwise should have. If, if, if I uh, am unable to hear with my ears, right? I, I, I mean, I live a wonderful, full and dignified life, of course, right? But you would say, anatomically speaking, I have been deprived of my hearing, or let's say I lose my hearing through um, some episode, there's a high volume event or something, I lose my hearing. I have been deprived of it, right? Um, this is something that you, you have been deprived of a state of, if you want, grace, uh, the state that human beings were in, in the Garden of Eden, as described in the book of Genesis, that, that uh, imagined starting point of the human spiritual journey, that starting point of human history, is when we lost that original innocence, uh, gained what William Blake, for example, calls experience, and moved into this process of history, right? Um, in that process, uh, for, for Augustine and for others that we've referred to, you know, we need to be saved. We cannot, by our own effort, succeed in uh, uh, achieving the, the life um, that we are called to live, according to this tradition. Uh, Bishop Barron, back to him here. The Latin word confessio can mean two things. On the one hand, an acknowledgement of wrongdoing, like I confessed to the crime, straightforward enough, um, but it also has a sense of proclamation. I proclaim something, right? What is your religious confession, right? I confess the truth of the gospel. So when I confess something, I stand by it, right? I, I proclaim it. I uphold it. Great. Um, what Barron is suggesting here, um, that the confession of sin, uh, let's finish the quotation first, this is why one of the practices of the Christian way is a stark confrontation with the reality of sin. If I am going to confess the Christian life, I will say, I am a Christian. That, that statement that eluded even Kierkegaard, right? <laughs> That has to come along with an acknowledgement in the view of Barron in this book that I am uh, subject to sin, that I actually need help. Last point here, um, a little helpful illustration of this, I think. The architects of the cathedrals, and he's talking about the big Gothic cathedrals in, in, in the European tradition, wanted to remind us, these architects, as we enter into the realm of the holy, into, into the house of God, right? I'm coming into the presence of the divine, that we are a people who walk in darkness. This is a theme often repeated in, in the post-conciliar church, by which I mean the Catholic church after, after the Second Vatican Council. We are a pilgrim church, a pilgrim people. A pilgrim is someone who is on the way, right? far, perhaps, 
from the destination of that pilgrimage, having set out long before, tired now on the way, and hopeful of reaching the destination. Perhaps at times there is danger, there is darkness, there is a sense of wandering, maybe one loses one's way. This is a characterization, uh, Barron proposes, of the Christian in this world. So here we have, thank you, Google Images, a picture of a dark interior of a Gothic cathedral. I mean, what what are these windows doing here? I mean, they're, they're casting light into a mostly dark interior, right? And, and this is reminding us, uh, uh, what is it, what is that light shining through? Which it's shining through very often, stained glass windows depicting scenes from the gospel, depicting figures, saints, who are known to have confessed that gospel, right? And so we find light in the darkness through the windows. Uh, but again, friends here, the, the key, as I've been kind of reflecting on Barron's chapter, the key here is that there's a problem. If there's no problem, then we don't need salvation. We are not in darkness. We're in light good enough, right? And, and, and this is the question it feels like I, uh, we need to ask ourselves, and I want to keep returning to that. Um, Baron, uh, here, as I mentioned above, um, in each of the chapters, he pairs his discussion with a well-known uh, work of literature, and, and in this case, the work is Dante's Divine Comedy, specifically the Purgatorial. Um, here at the beginning, though, he does briefly discuss a story by Flannery O'Connor, who's depicted here on the slide, along with the volume of her complete stories available uh, on Amazon for your pleasure. Um, the story is called Revelation, and it is set in a uh, doctor's office, and Baron in the chapter, uh, if you take a look at it, it offers a really nice description of it. I want to just kind of uh, highlight the, the, the denouement, the, the, the coming together of uh, his summary of the story. Um, the main character here is a Mrs. Turpin. Uh, she's the one at the doctor's office, uh, and she is sitting there among others, and as we will see uh, presently, uh, casting some some judgment uh, toward them. So let's uh, see how Barron describes it. These are Barron's words, and the quotations are taken from O'Connor's story. All of this, Barron writes, all of this comes to a head when Mrs. Turpin utters a soliloquy of gratitude for all the gifts that God has given her. If it's one thing I am, it's grateful, she says. When I think who all I could have been beside myself and what all I got, a little of everything and a good disposition besides, I just feel like shouting, thank you, Jesus, for making everything the way it is. This is like the uh, Pharisee in the temple who thanks God that he's not like all those other people who are sinners and living bad lives and ungenerous and whatnot. He, he praises God for how good he is. Thank you, God, for making me so good. Right. Okay, but let's, let's see where this goes. So clearly O'Connor has in mind this gospel story, but she's going to uh, bring it out in a different way. Uh, so, thank you, Jesus. With that, a book hits her directly over her left eye. It had been hurled by the unmannered college girl who now was on Mrs. Turpin, her fingers digging into the soft flesh of our hero's throat. The doctor and nurse scramble into action, pulling the crazed young woman away and giving her a shot to sedate her. Okay, out of nowhere, throwing a book at the lady, kind of prideful lady, but let's see how it plays out. Last slide here of Baron talking about Flannery O'Connor. But before she drifts into unconsciousness, the girl locks Mrs. Turpin in a fierce stare. And it occurs to Mrs. Turpin that this ugly and violent woman knows her in, quote, some intense and personal way. Half fascinated and half terrified, the older woman asks in a hoarse voice, what you got to say to me? Continuing to stare into Mrs. Turpin's face with an awful concentration, the young woman says, Go back to hell where you came from, you old warthog. Despite the vociferous protestations of the others in the room, Mrs. Turpin realizes, in some uncanny but definitive way, that the girl was right. 
that her words carried the force of a revelation. As a violent college student, as the violent college student is carried away, we learn her name, Mary Grace. Good Catholic name. What happens in this story? Mrs. Turpin is satisfied with herself. She's not sick. She's at a doctor's office, which is kind of ironic. She's, you know, pretty close to perfect. Yeah, she's imperfect in a few ways. She could be a bit better. But you know what? Life is good. and God has made her good, and thank God for it, right? This girl breaking in, crashing in to the well-ordered landscape of Mrs. Turpin's in her life is challenging all that and saying, wait a second, you know, who are you fooling? You think you're fooling yourself, but you know what? When the girl says that, Mrs. Turpin herself, this is the moment of revelation. Mrs. Turpin herself realizes it. She sees it in the same way we, you know, get a joke or, you know, you look, you're looking at a, a, I don't know, political cartoon or something like that. And suddenly you get it, right? That moment of insight. Mrs. Turpin has that insight. And this, as Barron goes on to discuss, this is what is meant by revelation, right? Not God simply dictating words. I mean, we're talking about the Catholic tradition here. What is meant by revelation is that moment of insight, that seeing, that, that recognition that is conveyed um, to uh, the, the would-be uh, believer. Great. Okay. The nature of sin. So, so we've got a, in Barron's view and view of the Catholic uh, uh, spiritual tradition, you got to wake up to this sense. It's not that everything's just kind of okay and it's cool. You, you, there's something in your life that fundamentally needs to change. What is that thing? That's, that's our key question. Henri de Lubac, uh, a well-known theologian of the 20th century, French uh, Dominican, spoke of sin as cette claudication mystérieuse, this mysterious limp, a limp in ourselves, right? We want to walk steadily, but we're limping. There's something, there's something a little off constantly. Uh, he caught in this way, Baron thinks, it's elusive, derivative, and parasitic quality. Sin is elusive. It's hard to pin down. It is derivative. It, it's not you know, simply an evil being outside, totally separate from myself. I'm good, but there's this evil being. No, sin is something in ourselves. It derives from ourselves, and it is parasitic. A parasite does not exist on its own. It requires a host, right? This is what the quotation here from de Lubac is suggesting, according to Baron, sin is. Uh, Baron distinguishes between capital S, sin, and sins in the plural. Right? That is to say, between the underlying disease and its many symptoms. Um, is something a sin? Is this breaking a, a, a rule or a law? It could be an important question, right? But the more fundamental question is not the plural sins that each of us daily commits on this view, um, but the underlying, call it disease, right? The sickness, the condition of constantly doing that despite ourselves. We seem to know what we ought to be, Baron writes here, but we are in fact something else, something else than what we know we ought to be. The spiritual frustration, this inner warfare, this debility of soul is sin. Spiritual frustration, inner warfare, debility of soul. Debility is, is, is if something is, is broken down, it's une, it, it lacks, lacks strength. He discusses uh, St. Paul, and the, on the next slide we'll see a bit from Pascal, um, but a very, very well-known line here from St. Paul, and, and, and I've taken all of the portions of uh, Paul's um, the text here, I believe it's in Galatians, um, and, and stitched them together. Um, this is St. Paul on the slide. This is the guy we saw earlier falling off his horse. I do not understand my own actions, says Paul, for I do not do what I want but I do the very thing I hate. I can will what is right, but I cannot do it. For though I delight in the law of God in my inmost self, I really do, like that's what I want to do, right? I see in my members, in my, in my body, in myself, another law at war with the law of my mind. Wretched man that I am, who will rescue me 
from this body of death. Rescue, right? Yeah, this this is kind of like I don't know I don't know how it works for you guys. I know that you know let's say I'm I'm home some night and I say well you know uh, I don't know I'm watching YouTube. Are you watching YouTube? Okay, I'm watching YouTube. And I say ah you know the last thing I'm going to do is watch YouTube for another twenty minutes. And then I watch YouTube for another 20 minutes. And I know perfectly well that I ought not to do that. It's silly. It's a waste of time. And what am I even watching, right? But I do it. I do it anyway. Okay, so I'm like, well, you got to have more willpower, right? But this is the crux in the matter. Because what Christianity is proposing through this, this second path, this, this recognition of oneself as a sinner, is that it's not only a matter of willpower. It's not a matter of just trying harder, being more perfect, being more, you know, prepared to, to, to you know, impress God with, with your discipline, right? It, it's a matter of devoting yourself, of, of, of opening yourself to the help, the aid, call it the grace offered by Christ um, for the Catholic Church through the church and through the sacraments of the church. Another slide here, um, the Blaise Pascal, a couple, couple further lines here discussed by, by Barron in his chapter. We are incapable of not, Pascal says, desiring truth and happiness. We will necessarily want what is true and we will want to be happy. Okay. Uh, but we're also incapable of attaining either certainty of truth or happiness. We want these things. We strive after them. That defines our life. That is, that's the kind of engine that, that propels us on our daily ways. However, we cannot reach it. We cannot get it. And we cannot hold it in a secure way. This is due to Christianity, our sinfulness, our subjugation to sin, rather than Christianity, subjugation to Christ. Next passage here. Man is neither angel nor beast, and it is unfortunately the case that anyone trying to act the angel acts the beast. A lot of wisdom I would propose to you, friends, in, in that line. If I try to be perfect, if I'm a, a rigorist, a, a, a Jansenist, for those of you in the know about church history, a movement that was not dis unconnected from, from Blaise Pascal himself, if I try to be perfect, I try to be an angel, right? try to, to do everything exactly right, I'm setting myself up for, maybe not a mistaken term, a fall. I'm setting myself up to become, quote, the beast, right? To become a beast, to act in a beastly way, right? I'm going to be a Puritan. I'm going to demand the, the, the intense rigorism at all times and not rely also on God's mercy as, as well as God's judgment. Well, I could riff on these things, but I, I would leave that quotation from Pascal uh, to yourself for your consideration. Um, here's the, the, the kind of description of sin, though, uh, building on everything that we've been talking about that, that Barron settles on, and I think it's a good one. He writes the following. Um, Augustine, so this is St. Augustine that we saw back at the beginning. Augustine offers one of the pithiest definitions of sin. This is capital S, sin, the disease, right? Sin is the state of being in curvatus in se, of being caved in on oneself. The powers of the soul, which are meant to orient us to nature and other human beings in the cosmos, and finally the infinite mystery of God, are focused in on the tiny and infinitely uninteresting ego. Like a black hole, the sinful soul draws all of the light and energy around it into itself, caved in on itself. Right? So sin is a kind of self-involvement narrowness of vision, a blindness to the things that Christianity, God has created us to be oriented toward, including nature, other human beings, the cosmos, and God himself. We're not interested in those things because we're scared, we're defensive, right? We're protecting what is ours. We want more, pride, greed, anger, sloth, lust, all of the things, right? This is all about us. We've caved in, collapsed on ourselves. The example of this that Baron provides, he's going to be going on to talk a little bit more about Dante, and we'll do so very briefly as well, is Lucifer, uh, presented here in, in Canto 34 of Dante's Inferno. That is the very last of the, the sections, the cantos of that famous 
poem, um, the Inferno being the first of three parts of the Divine Comedy, the Inferno, the Purgatorio, and the Paradiso. Significantly, as Baron discusses here, uh, Lucifer at the center of hell in Dante's conception is not sitting in a flaming center because the point is that Lucifer is infinitely far from the light and thus the warmth of God. Lucifer is in a sea of ice. He is frozen. He's beating his wings, these bat wings, to try to, to preserve some kind of warmth, but it's as if, and he's literally in a cave as well, in the center of hell, right? Um, the distance between him and everyone else and everything else in creation is infinite. And it's this isolation, this being caved in on yourself that for Baron is the disease of sin. This is the sickness that for this tradition we are subjected to, this self-involvement that blinds us to what is outside. Just a few words on, on Dante here uh, to, to highlight some of the main features of what Baron talks about. And again, take a look at the lecture on Dante. I go through it in more detail elsewhere on the channel. Um, Dante's Purgatorio, what does Baron say here? We have to know, Baron writes, that we are sinners. We're subjected to this condition, sin, right? Not in the abstract Cartesian sense, he's using that again to talk about kind of our modern point of view, but in the more classical sense of experiencing through intimacy. We have to, sensual images here, we have to smell the stench, taste the acidity, touch the rough texture of our sin. There is no more thorough narrative in our tradition of this painful and liberating process than Dante's Divine Comedy. This is something that you often hear discussed in connection with the Holocaust uh, in the Second World War. There's this abstraction. Um, Hannah Arendt, the well-known political philosopher, wrote in her famous book about Adolf Eichmann, the Nazi functionary who basically made the trains run and made the Holocaust possible. Uh, she, she, she referred, in reference to Eichmann, to the banality of evil, the banality of evil. Everything for Eichmann was abstract. There were numbers of people and distances and certain amounts of fuel to power the trains and certain number of spaces and camps. All of it was abstract, right? He had a Cartesian sense of what was happening, but he did not smell and taste and touch the reality of what it was he was doing. Only when presented, I mean, I don't know in Eichmann's case, but for ourselves, only pre presented with the full reality of what it is we are doing, can we in fact recognize uh, what this whole discussion so far has been prompting us to consider, that we are a sinner. And this is the, the straight up discomforting, uh, discomforting, Dis uh, uncomfortable uh, statement. Now in Dante's case, Again, we're not doing a whole lecture here on Dante, but there's Dante. Off to the off to the uh, uh, left, I guess it would be, is the Inferno. So you can see the sort of demonic presences and people and whatnot in that space. Um, the mountain in the center here refers to the Purgatorio, and that's what uh, Baron focuses his remarks on, this ascent out of the uh, mire of our sinful condition on Earth, to the, the peak there, and you can see kind of Adam and Eve depicted at the top there, the, the earthly paradise, basically remaking Eden, not on our own terms, but on God's terms. And then you have all those layers up in the sky, and this corresponds to the celestial spheres of the, the Paradiso, about which we will not speak here. Um, briefly, though, um, and I will not be, be reading this. I mean, pause if you're interested, and thank you to whomever produced this image. It wasn't me. It's a helpful image. Um, Dante begins this walk in the middle of life, he famously says. He has lost his way in a dark wood. Right? So this is okay. It's an allegory of some kind. Dante's living his life, just like you're living your life, I'm living mine. And suddenly he wakes up, as it were. He begins to look at things in a new way and says, oh no, <laughs> what, what's going on here, right? Uh, 
And uh, so he is accompanied by various people, by, by Virgil, and then later by um, Beatrice, and finally by St. Bernard of Clairvaux, as, as the divine comedy, so-called, uh, unfolds. Uh, but it begins in the Inferno, corresponding to the Christian vision of hell. Um, and in this, um, you move through a series of the, the seven deadly sins, more or less, and then he... he designates them a bit differently here in a few places. But you start with what Dante regards as, as the least uh, onerous, or onerous is not quite the word, um, worst, at least bad, of these uh, sins, which is lust followed by gluttony, greed, anger, heresy, violence, fraud, and finally treachery. And it is in treachery that we find Lucifer uh, chewing the bodies of Brutus, Cassius, and, um, and Judas. Dante needs to go through this process to see, to touch the rough texture of his own sin. He's, this is not just him, you know, taking a trip to kind of gawk at those foolish people who, 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 who fell victim to it. Dante himself has fallen victim to it, and, and only when he sees the full reality of the, the inner state of himself, and then in the purgatorio rises above that or is raised, as, as, as we might say, um, only then uh, can he have the vision of God that he has at the end of the Divine Comedy. Just briefly again, and, and thanks also to the to producer of this image, uh, who is not myself, uh, we have the, the Seven Story Mountain, this being the title of a work by Thomas Merton, the, the Baron, refers to. Uh, we, we have our, our seven deadly sins precisely. Pride, envy, wrath, sloth, greed, or avarice, gluttony, and lust. Um, in each of these, as Baron talks about symbolically in, in Dante's story, it's, it's a pairing of each with their opposite. And in each case, Dante provides an example of how uh, the Virgin Mary, um, she being a central figure in the Catholic tradition, uh, gives a living example of what it is not to fall victim to that particular so-called deadly sin. So if I lived my life in a way that was very proud, in purgatory, in order to purge myself of that sin, I practice humility, right? If I was very envious during my life, I am practice mercy toward others. If I was very angry or wrathful, I practice peace. And so when up the mountain to this earthly paradise at the top. The process is key here. Number one, recognizing that there's a problem. Because again, if there's no problem, you should just turn this lecture off right now. <laughs> What's there to talk about? It's all about just like feeling generally good. That That's not so valuable. Um, so number one, in this, if you're going to go to this tradition, the, the way to do it is to recognize that there's a problem and to recognize that there is a process, a deeply personal visceral, physical process that you go through to deal with that problem, and that all of us, in various ways, are going through presently. Uh, no one alive is simply, no, no one living in this mortal life um, is simply done with this process. No one is perfect, and no one can make herself perfect. Last word here from, um, from Baron. Uh, on the purgatorio. I believe this is the last word we'll have. Uh, Bishop Barron writes, only when the will, that is your personal will, whereby you will things, I decide things, only when the will is utterly surrendered to the higher will, God, are real soul expansion and mission possible. Soul expansion you, know, you won't be caved in on yourself. You're going to expand. And mission, missio, like a missile, right? I'm going to be sent. The seven deadly sins, Baron continues, are various modes of willfulness. Willfulness is a negative term here. It means just doing what I want because I want. Right? The seven deadly sins are various modes of willfulness, diverse ways in which the ego blocks the deepest appropriation and activation of the center. Go back to the last video if you're interested in this. Remember, the first path was finding the center. Right? So we found that center, and now in the second path, we're kind of clearing our way to, to make it our center. 
When they are addressed, when these diverse modes of willfulness are addressed, the divine will, God's will, can operate unencumbered through the human will. And it is just this paradoxical state of affairs that is signaled by Paul's phrase, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And that definitely is Galatians. It is no longer I who live, me. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm recording a lecture right now. I, I teach at a college, etc. blah, 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 right? That's all me. But what this tradition is saying is that so long as I am primarily identified with that, I'm primarily concerned with enabling the will of myself, in that narrow sense, to be achieved, I will be, number one, subject to sin. I will still have this disease. Number two, I will not actually attain truth or happiness or be able fully to do what I want to do. Um, and number three, I will be in need of a savior. And we're coming on to that language of savior presently because Christianity is not only presenting a problem, it is presenting a solution. Jesus as judge and savior. I, I should have put up the image there of the Christ Pantocrator. You can Pantocrator, uh, Panto, P-A-N-T-O, uh, C-R-A-T-O-R, Pantocrator, Christ, Christ creator of all. It's a, it's a beautiful image of Christ. I believe it's from an Egyptian monastery. I could be mistaken. Maybe it's Coptic. Of half of his face is very severe and heavy, and he's holding, holding a book right? But half of his face is kind and gentle and merciful. Jesus as judge and savior. Gosh, I, I wish I had put that up. Jesus called the Christ, Jesus of Nazareth, is both of those things in the Christian tradition, not just one, right? So if, if you forget the savior part uh, and you focus too much on the sin part or you think that you're the one, you're bad, you know, well, we know you're bad, we're all bad, right? But if you focus on your sin to the point of inducing a, a, a guilt that is kind of incapacitating, that guilt can actually be narrowly ego-driven, right? So anyway, okay, I'll spare you my psychologizing. Let's see what Barron says here. So Jesus as judge and savior. Uh, Bishop Barron writes the following. The New Testament insists that Jesus both shows us that we are sinners, he's a judge, that's kind of what we've been talking about, and offers us the way out of sin, he is the Savior. When one or the other of these emphases, plural emphasis, is lost, the walking of the second path, that's this one, is decisively compromised, either through overconfidence or through terror right? If I think, you know, yeah, yeah, I'm a sinner. It's bad. I do, I do genuinely feel bad about it. But you know what? In the end, we're all going to make it. Everything's going to be fine. We're all going to go to heaven. Everything's going to kind of get reabsorbed back into the, the universal all, and we'll be present with God. And I'm going to be overconfident. I'm going to, I'm, I'm not going to force myself to do the hard, painful, indeed self-effacing, in a sense, work that is called for by this tradition. On the other hand, terror, if I forget that Jesus loves me unconditionally and died for me on uh, Calvary and so forth, then I'm going to be terrified because I'm, is everybody going to hell, right? I'm clearly not perfect. All of us are imperfect and all of us are sick. So either one of these things, he thinks, is gonna make it impossible for us to, quote, walk this path. We're just going to get stuck either way. Uh, the farmer, he continues a little further down. So he, we're talking about, we're going to start talking about judge, right? Because I mean, judging people, I mean, I don't know. We're not supposed to judge people, right? Isn't that in the Bible? Don't judge people, right? But we judge all the time. Friends, I, mean, I, I would offer this to you. When I'm crossing the street, I make a judgment. Is the car that's coming down the street going to hit me or not? I make, I make a judgment call right? That doesn't mean I'm judging the car. I think it's you know, going to hell or it's evil or something like that. But we judge all the time. And that's the kind of judgment I would submit that Baron has in mind here when he's talking about Christ the judge. He, he, he's not a vindictive judge, a, a punishing judge, right? But a person who is able to recognize things for what they are, like Mary Grace in the story from Flannery O'Connor. She's able to see things as they are. And even Mrs. Turpin, 
like, yeah, she, she sees it too. She sees it too, because it's plain to see for those with eyes to see. Um, back to the paragraph here. The farmer in first century Palestine would place the newly harvested wheat on the floor of the barn, and then using a sort of pitchfork would toss the grain in the air, forcing the lighter chaff to separate itself from the usable wheat. Separate the wheat from the chaff. Have you heard that? Biblical phrase. Thus, Jesus's presence, Jesus's presence in history would be a winnowing fan, winnowing fan, the agent of separation and clarification, that pitchfork thing, right? That, that's using, it's not, it's not the devil that uses the pitchfork. <laughs> Interesting. It's actually Jesus. Jesus uses the pitchfork um, in order to separate what is usable, uh, uh, flourishing, healthy, loving, all-embracing, good, from what is a chaff, what is, is, is only fit to be burned, right? Not to punish it and make the chaff scream. It should, here, here's an image. Um, wheat and chaff. Um, there's some kind of watermark there. I know. It's all educational purposes, right? So on the right, we have wheat, usable, edible wheat, ready to go, make some flour. On the left, we have chaff. I mean, I don't know about you. I'm not very agriculturally competent, but this is the difference between an ear of corn and the husk of the corn, right? The husk of the corn is good for nothing. I don't think you can even make a soup out of the husk of a corn, right? You, you, you um, dispose of the husk of the corn and you eat the corn, right? So that's the kind of judgment that is being made here. And there is our winnowing fan. So, so you, you, you throw it up and as you do, the light uh, chaff comes off of the grains of wheat, and the wheat heavier falls to the bottom, and the chaff sits on top. So you end up with a separation of the two, right? But you don't separate the wheat from the chaff before the wheat is fully grown, or what do you do? You kill the wheat, right? Same thing with the corn. If I husk the corn before the corn is ready to be eaten, if it's like it's still green, it's still developing, then both the wheat and uh, both the corn and the husk will be worthless, right? So you have to let them both mature together until it's time to separate the wheat from the chaff such that you have the usable wheat. We'll talk about this in class, if we have class. Have class. A couple more passages here from Baron, and then we're gonna, gonna wrap it up. Jesus as judge and savior still, quote, Baron, a favorite ruse a ruse is a kind of lie that we tell ourselves, a game that we play, right? A favorite ruse of sinners is to wrap themselves in the mantle of respectability. Jesus the judge is the one who rips away the cloak, literally unveiling, revealing, there we go, some etymology for you, revealing the truth of things. Whenever we are tempted to think that all is well with us, we hold up the cross of Jesus and let our illusions die. And I would hazard here, it's not just that all is well, because all of us know that not all is well, right? All of us are aware that we're falling short. We're not as, you know, whatever, as we'd like to be. We're not exactly the person we'd like to be. But we tell ourselves, it's okay. I'm pretty good. I'm 90%, right? I, 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 I'm, I'm doing okay. Right? And what this tradition is proposing, again, is that Fundamentally, that is an illusion, right? And why is it an illusion? Because, yeah, even if there are many good things, it's not about there being more or fewer good things. It's about the direction you're moving in. Conversio, to convert, means to turn around. Same thing in Greek, metanoia, right? Uh, so when you turn around, when you change your life, that's when you can be confident that you're going on the, in the right direction, even if, of course, things will remain imperfect. Um, but th there's a danger here that we miss something that is fundamentally off in ourselves um, if we tell ourselves that, you know, I, I, I'm 90%, I'm 80%, I'm, I'm more or less good. Last passage here, uh, the terrible, now we're going to turn now towards Savior and then should have probably indicated that better on the slide here, but Baron writes, the terrible disorder of the cross, that is the killing of the Son of God, like not so good, is addressed not through an explosion of divine vengeance, 
but through a radiation of divine love, period. When Christ confronts those who contributed to his death, he speaks words not of retribution, but of reconciliation and compassion. How are we saved? What does it mean to be saved? How is Jesus a savior? That's the problem that we've been dealing with throughout these remarks, right? There, we're sick. We need help. We need a savior. Okay, it's got a savior. It's Jesus. How does it happen? When met with violence and hatred, Jesus declines to seek retribution, declines to punish, but rather speaks in this language of reconciliation and compassion. We see examples of this in the more recent practice of figures like Mohandas Gandhi or Martin Luther King Jr. Um, in the practice of nonviolence, I would submit to you. Um, last one here, I believe it is. <clears throat> Let's check. Yes, it is. By creating a way out of our net of sinfulness, Darren writes, by doing what no mere philosopher, poet, politician, or social reformer could possibly do, Jesus saved us. Jesus created a way out of the net of our sinfulness. Remember, sinfulness is to be caved in on yourself, to be trapped, to be stuck doing what you don't want to do. Addiction, in our modern sense, is a great illustration of this. What Jesus offers within this tradition is a way out of that net, a way out of that trap, not by strengthening our ego sense of self or giving us what we narrowly want, but by breaking us open and leading us to see what we were blind to before, to see nature, other human beings, the cosmos, God himself, to see those things into which we are called uh, to have, or with which we are called to have a relationship. Last passage. Even as we run away from the Father, we are running directly into the arms of the Son, says Barron. Given God's heartbroken embrace of us at our worst, that is, when we human beings killed him, <clears throat> that is his son, what in the entire universe could ever make us fall out of friendship with God? Paul's answer, neither time nor space, neither the greatest nor the least, neither powers above the earth or on it or below it. Nothing can call us out of this friendship with God. And Baron concludes, this feeling of being safe in the divine embrace is salvation. Salvation does not mean I never sin again. <clears throat> salvation on this view means that I, I turn around, metanoia, conversio, right? I turn around, and yes, I continue to live my life, and yes, tragically, I continue to sin, but I do so now with a confidence that I am in relationship with someone who, who will enable me to overcome that sin with love, with compassion, with reconciliation, instead of continuing this cycle. I've been released from the net of my sinfulness. Sinfulness remains with me maybe like a limp, but it's not a cage. It's not something that uh, threatens, um, in fact, the, the, uh, the life of my soul itself. All right. Two more slides here, just some comments on the practices. What are these practices? Baron actually goes on about these for a number of pages in some detail. Um, one is the confession of sin, and, and that's kind of step one. Like, uh, And by the way, I, I say again, I think I said this earlier, if everything's cool and sin is not a thing, like if every, you know, if you are exactly what you think you should be all the time, this tradition does not speak to you. <laughs> this is a salvation religion. We, we, you got to have a problem in order to care about the solution, right? The re religion is not just about generally being nice and volunteering when you can. Um, you don't need religion for that. Everyone can do that all the time and should. Uh, this is a different kind of path, and that's why we're talking about Baron's book. Um, he uses the example here of Merton's um, Fire Watch, uh, and it's a beautiful text, um, and, and uh, this is for, for Baron. Um, a way of uh, preparing 
um, to, to, it's a kind of examination of conscience, as we would say in this tradition. You're thinking through your life, you're examining yourself in, in, in brutal honesty and, and, and not cutting any corners or pulling any punches. You're, you're admitting to yourself fully what it is um, that is leading you astray. Uh, and, and this for Baron is, is step one, because if you're not sick, go home, forget it. Um, <clears throat> uh, second, uh, truth-telling, to live out the truth even when it costs. And, and maybe this is one reason why this section ends up being so long. Barron refers to both um, examples from liberalism, referring to the philosophers Rawls and Habermas, for example, um, and communism, I'm referring to the resistance to communism of Václav Havel, the Czechoslovakian um, uh, uh, um, activist and, and president. Um, the, the quotation that'll make these make sense to us is this, Christian truth-telling in the 20th century has challenged both of the great ideological options of the modern era, both liberalism, I read capitalism, and communism, right? So individualism and collectivism, if you like. Um, what is Barron's message here, as I take it, that talking about sin, <laughs> all the stuff we've been doing now for, for upwards of an hour, um, is not something that either liberalism or communism or individualism or collectivism, any of these isms, it's not something that they want or they're comfortable with. It's something that disrupts what they're trying to do. And so Christian truth-telling of being willing to stand up and call out something like Mary Grace did in the story from Flannery O'Connor is one of the things that we can practice if we are following the second path. And then finally, <clears throat> forgiveness. And he here discusses an example of a, an Amish family who, um, who very, I mean, just super erogatory kind of thing, above, above and beyond, um, forgave uh, a young man who had um, mortally injured their son uh, and actually testified in his, on his behalf. He discusses the case of a Cardinal Joseph, or Joseph Cardinal Bernadine, uh, when he was accused of um, sexual misconduct and 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 proven uh, vindicated of, of of that charge, and then he presents this phrase, which I think is is a nice thing to keep in mind as as we wrap up. Mercy mocks justice. Yes, justice is important, but mercy mocks justice. That that mercy is somehow some it, it's something that is always together with justice, in this tradition anyway. And if you have justice without mercy, that is as dangerous perhaps as mercy without justice. Uh, and our last point here is his discussion in Luke chapter 7, the Gospel of Luke chapter 7, of um, a figure of a woman who is, who is a prostitute in that, in that story. Uh, Barron comments in the following way, it is not she, that woman, um, is not that she loves and is therefore forgiven, but that she is forgiven and therefore she loves. And I would, um, <clears throat> taking that off, we can just wrap up on that, on that note. It is not that she loves and is forgiven, right? Because if that were the case, she would have to love first. And that means it's on her. She has to, you know, have this heroic discipline to overcome all of her badness by herself, and then God will forgive her for the good job she's done. No. For this tradition, it's that you are forgiven first. That's the salvation Jesus thing, right? And then once you are forgiven, in response to that forgiveness, for which you perhaps feel so undeserving, you love. There we have it, friends. Uh, a discussion, I suppose, of the, the second spiritual path presented here by Robert Barron in his book um, from 2002, but also, in a way, a, a kind of short-form synopsis of, uh, of Christianity. So, offered uh, for your consideration, and thank you for your attention. We'll be back with Path 3 uh, soon. <laughs>